The Master Keys series of mechanical keyboards from Cooler Master features genuine Cherry MX switches and the flexibility of choice. Whether you want small, medium, or large, you can pick your size and pick your color with RGB and clear white LED backlighting options. Click the sponsor link in the description for more information. Excellent! So I feel like I should be more excited about today. It is Monday, June 19th, and there is a new Intel high-end desktop platform on the market. Today, you're gonna to be able to read or watch legitimate Intel Core X series CPU reviews, and you can pre-order these chips today now as well. But you shouldn't, because pre-ordering things is generally a bad idea. The actual for sale date when these will ship out is June 24th. So why am I not more excited about this? I mean, I've used Intel's high-end desktop platform since they kicked it off with X58, the first platform with triple channel memory. I enthusiastically moved up to X79 and X99 when they launched. The high-end Intel stuff usually gets refreshed about every three years. And today marks the move from X99 and the LGA 2011-3 socket to X299 and the LGA 2066 socket. I think the subdued response to this launch though is caused by three things. One is that it was definitely rushed, and there's plenty of evidence that Intel wasn't actually planning to kick off this platform for another two months or so. Uh, for example, the 12 core and higher CPUs that they have announced are still just on paper, and they aren't expected to until August to October 2017. And many reviewers, including myself, still haven't received a CPU sample to test directly from Intel. Two is that there's actually competition from AMD on the horizon with their recently announced Threadripper series, which will also be a high-end desktop solution. And three, the existence of two four-core CPUs at the bottom of this CPU stack that only have 16 PCIe lanes and are essentially KB Lake CPUs, the 7600K and 7700K, stapled onto a much larger package with a higher TDP and no iGPU, which also means no quick sync. These two CPUs are the 7640X and the 7740X, and since Gigabyte was kind enough to lend me a 7740X so I could get up and running with today's video, I've decided to make that the focus of today's video. What happens when you plug in a 16 PCIe Lane KB Lake X CPU into one of these high-end motherboards that is also designed for Skylake X CPUs that might have 28 or 44 PCI Express lanes? The short answer is a lot of stuff doesn't work. So the example boards I have for you today are the Gigabyte Aorus X299 Gaming 7, the MSI X299 Gaming Pro Carbon AC, and the Asus Prime X299 Deluxe. As of today, the MSI board will cost you about $360, the ASUS is $490, and the Gigabyte Aorus is about $400. The cheapest X299 board I could find on Newegg was $230, and that's an ASRock board that doesn't even launch until July 15th. Keep that price in mind, as these are high-end desktop boards. Usually a full-featured mainstream Intel Z270 or AMD X370 motherboard can be found for $150 to $200. Now, motherboard connects your processor to everything else in your system, and today I'll be focusing on how it does that, specifically the connection between the processor and your memory, and the processor and PCI Express lanes. System memory is simpler, so let's start there. KB Lake X CPUs have a dual-channel memory controller, and Skylake X CPUs have a quad-channel memory controller. Basically, this means that on every X299 motherboard, you can only use half of the memory slots if you pair it with a 7740X or 7640X. For eight DIMM boards like the ones that I have today, that means the entire left bank of slots goes unused. And for some X299 boards that only have four DIMM slots, that means you can only use two of them, which is like having an ITX board. All three of these boards list that limitation very specifically in the manual, so you know which slots to populate based on your hardware and your memory kit. So that's good. PCI Express is next, and that's where it gets a little bit more confusing. Remember that the PCI Express lane breakdown of 16 for KB Lake X and 28 or 44 for Skylake X refers to PCI Express directly connected to the CPU. These are usually routed to PCI Express expansion slots, uh, but those can also be connected up to M.2 for N NVMe SSDs, for example. There's also 20 to 24 PCIe 3.0 lanes that are available through the X299 chipset but the chipset is actually kind of acting like a big PCIe switch in this case. There's actually four PCIe lanes available to the chipset, which are multiplied via the switch to connect multiple devices like SATA drives, USB ports, network adapters, and M.2 or U.2 slots for SSDs. The fact that these are on a switch is usually not a big deal because the chipset's bandwidth rarely gets fully saturated, but if you're accessing multiple high-speed storage devices like NVMe SSDs, it can create a bottleneck. 
The upside to NVMe SSDs connected through the chipset is that you can RAID up to three of them together with Intel Rapid Storage technology, and yes, that can be RAIDed in a bootable array. So with all this in mind, let's see how these three boards implement the connectivity options that are provided by Intel. I'm going to start with this MSI board since they provided a block diagram in their manual. As you can see, it's uh, clearly laid out that the CPU PCIe lanes are all routed to the full-size PCI Express expansion slots, and everything else is connected through the chipset. That includes a couple of these short little PCIe by one slots. They also added a page or two of extra explanation for KB Lake X setups in the manual. And here we can see that with a 44 lane CPU, we'd have by 16, by 4, by 16, and by 8 on all of these full size slots. But with a 16 lane CPU, it's cut down to by 8 and by 8 for two way support, or by 8, by 4, by 4. And in all cases with a 16 lane CPU, this bottom slot becomes useless. Moving over to storage, since everything else goes through the chipset, MSI used a switch to connect up the two M.2s, uh, the U.2 and the SATA ports. Uh, fortunately, again, they used an extra page in the manual to explain how this all breaks down, uh, where you can see that the more M.2 or U.2 connected devices that you have, the fewer SATA ports remain active since they share bandwidth. Next, let's look at the ASUS Prime X299 Deluxe. No block diagram here, unfortunately, but based on the PCIe breakdown in the manual, we can see that ASUS, like MSI, decided that with KB Lake X CPUs, all lanes should be dedicated to PCIe expansion slots, most likely for GPUs, with a single by 16 at the top, or by 8 and by 8 in the two primary slots being the two options. This again means that the chipset lanes handle everything else. So your options become choose between your 802.11ad Wi-Fi and that top PCIe by one expansion slot. I'd probably go with the Wi-Fi. If you lose, if you use the lower PCIe by one slot, you lose a SATA port. You get to choose between the second full length PCIe X16 slot and your front panel USB 3.1 port. Uh, you get to choose between the bottom full length PCIe by 16 slot and a couple more SATA ports and uh, the vertical M.2 over there, as well as the U.2 connector share bandwidth. And I'm not positive right now, I'm still waiting on word back from ASUS, but that means that either you can't use them at the same time, or they're gonna split the bandwidth between them, giving you uh, by two PCIe Gen 3 on each instead of by four. And finally, we have the Aorus X299 Gaming 7. And for the CPU PCI Express lanes, Gigabyte bucked the trend here and ditches the two-way SLI support with the KB Lake X CPU. Uh, for this round, your top slot is gonna be locked at by eight and you can add another by four connection uh, with the third slot on here. The bottom slot just won't work at all. And the second slot is actually a by four connection uh, that is shared with the M.2 slot that's right above it. This means that that M.2 slot is a dedicated full bandwidth PCIe 3.0 by 4 M.2 connection directly to the CPU, which is cool. But I wish that that slot location wasn't right under the main GPU location because it can get warm right there. Also, there's no access to it from Intel rapid storage technology for RAID setups because it's not routed through the chipset. So bear that in mind, but possibly a great option for like a single boot drive or something like that. Now, because they only wired up two M.2 slots through the chipset though, that means there's less interference with the SATA. So you'll notice through the chart here that you're not gonna lose too much SATA depending on what you connect in. You're only gonna lose four SATA ports if you happen to use that bottom most M.2 slot. So I think those are all the configuration changes for KB Lake X CPUs combined with these X299, X299 motherboards at least. And I don't blame you if you're just a little confused. Let me reiterate that most of these conflicts we've talked about today will go away if you have a full fat Skylake X CPU with 44 PCIe lanes in one of these boards. But those start at $1,000 for the 10 core 7900X. 28 lane CPUs should hopefully be available soon as well to help bridge that gap. It does kind of suck that the eight core only has 28 lanes this time around, but anyway, I'm sure there's much more to be said about this launch, this platform, and everything else. In my opinion, the KB Lake X CPUs still don't make a whole lot of sense for this platform. Intel high-end desktop PCs are supposed to be about maximum performance and connectivity, and you lose out on a lot of that with a 7640X or a 7740X. The main claim to fame of these CPUs is overclocking, and they do seem to be very capable of hitting well above 5 GHz based on early tests I've seen and some Computex demos, uh, even with just a decent air cooler or an all-in-one, so that's kind of cool. So I'll recommend this. If you need a gaming PC, consider Intel's mainstream Z270 platform or the Ryzen lineup from AMD. You're going to spend a lot less, you're going to get more bang for your buck. If you really, really like overclocking, 
or if you just absolutely know that you love the Enthusiast platform and you want to get in on it, but you don't have that much money right now and you just need something to get you started, but especially plan on upgrading to a higher core count CPU down the line, especially once those really high core count CPUs are available later this year, feel free to jump in and have some fun. Just remember that AMD has Threadripper lurking just around the corner, promised by the end of summer, and supposedly it's not going to have all of this PCI Express lane confusion as all of their chips are going to have 64 PCIe 3.0 lanes. Waiting to see how things play out in the next couple months, I think, is probably going to be the smartest move you can make. Thanks a lot for watching, guys. We'll see you next time.